It's said that there are now more cranes in the skies of Ontario's capital city constructing more new developments than in any other city in North America. With that explosive growth comes a great debate. Are we growing too much, too fast? Can services keep up? What do we need to do to accommodate the additional hundreds of thousands of people expected to move to the GTA in the coming years? Let's discuss all of that with Dave Wilkes. He's the president and CEO of BUILD. That's the Building Industry and Land Development Association. Eileen Costello, partner at the law firm Aird Burles LLP. Kristen Wong Tam, city councillor for Toronto Centre. And Joe Cressy, Toronto City Councillor for Spadina, Fort York. And it's good to have all four of you around our table. Two newbies on this panel here this evening. Good to have you here. I will confess off the top that what prompted our interest in doing this discussion was a press release you guys sent out uh, some months ago, which said the following. You said your organization, Dave, was outraged by the decision of Joe Cressy, Mike Layton, and Kristen Wong Tam to red light as in stop, any development that supports the TO core plan, that's the plan for Toronto's downtown. You said this trio ignored the direction of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You said it was political interference that slows housing and increases costs for the city and new home buyers. So seriously, get off the fence and tell us what you really think about <laughs> oh, you these know, guys. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I, which... I, I don't like to mince words, obviously. <laughs> obviously. What's your concern here? So uh, my concern really is based on an overall concern about housing supply. As you said in your introduction, Steve, we have about 115,000 uh, more people moving to the GTA every year. Within the city of Toronto, 75,000 more people. Uh, we need housing. And, and the concern really is that uh, we need to stop talking about uh, the growth and, and debating the growth. The growth is coming. Uh, we've, we've seen that by the numbers. And we really do have a concern, unless we start addressing this, unless we start providing the supply that is needed, uh, we're going to be in a, a crisis that uh, was only going to add to affordability. Do you think these two are obstacles to good growth? Uh, no, I think where we need to have is a conversation about how to accommodate the growth. I think the TO core plan uh, defines in, in many ways what that growth should look like, uh, make sure it's aligned with public policy that's been developed by the provincial government and other areas, builds around uh, transit and, and leverages that investment. So I think there is a, an opportunity for uh, governments at all levels, municipal, provincial, federal, the communities within the various neighbourhoods around uh, the city, and our industry to work together to make sure that we uh, do address what I think is an inescapable generational problem about the need to provide more housing. Kristen, I'm going to ask you that same last direct question. Do you think you are an obstacle to the kind of growth that we need in order to accommodate the numbers of people who are going to move here? Uh, absolutely not. And I think it's almost laughable to even suggest that this is political interference on behalf of the councillors and myself um, when we know that the unilateral decision that came from Queen's Park, 224 changes to the Teal Court, which is the City of Toronto's new 25-year secondary plan, uh, and that they did not have have political interference. That political influence was, was powerful. The development lobby has been all over Queen's Park. The changes that came out of the, the Teal Core uh, amendments uh, had everything to do with what the development lobby wanted. So to even suggest that the councillors downtown who are trying to protect and defend the public process that came out of Teal Core uh, is, I would say, incredulous. Eileen, how do you see it? Uh, I, well, I see it as a complex issue, um, but I think I'd start with this notion of it being a unilateral interference by the provincial government. I think what we need to step back and recognize is that City Council made a determination to advance their official plan amendments to the province for review and approval. They didn't need to make that decision. They made that decision because they thought it would make those, those um, uh, planning instruments immune from appeal by individual developers. So it wasn't a unilateral decision. It was a decision that the City of Toronto put to the province. They said, please review our plan and approve it. The province is obligated under the Planning Act when doing that to make sure that the plan they're approving conforms with provincial policy and conforms with legislation. That's in the Planning Act as well. So this occurred right at the same time that Bill 108 was coming out. Bill, Bill 108, 108. It, Bill 108 is, a, is really an omnibus bill which is changing core pieces of legislation in the province. The Planning Act, the Development Charges Act, the Heritage Act. And so there was a necessary step that had to be taken to take these plans and bring them into alignment with provincial policy. That's mandated by law. So it's not unilateral, and it's politically interfering 
And as much as the growth plan was political interference when that was brought in, you know, over a decade ago, and other municipalities in the 905 screamed and said, we don't want the province setting growth targets for us. Provinces do this. They bring forward provincial legislation. And, you know, we may find it challenging in the city of Toronto that we're a creature of the province and that we have to conform. But that's the way this works. People in my business, though, are always looking for villains. Mm. Is there a villain in this tale? I, I think... I think if there's a villain, um, it's the fact that we've been slow to respond to the pace of growth in Toronto for over a decade. Um, I've been practicing as a lawyer for about 15 years. I've never seen the kind of sustained level of growth that we've seen in the last sort of seven to 10 years. So it's probably never happened. It's never happened before. But what we didn't have in place at the time was I think a mechanism to respond efficiently and effectively at the municipal level to that amount of growth. I don't think there's any debate that we've got a housing issue in Toronto. I don't think there's any debate that we have an affordability issue in Toronto. What concerns me is we're here today debating red light, green light, and what I'd love to talk about is what's the green light? What are we actually gonna do at the municipal level to incentivize and to move things forward? Because I can get a development approval to council very quickly. I've worked with, with this councillor in particular on some of that, and I get my approval, and then I'm still waiting 12 months, 18 months, sometimes two years to get through the process at the city staff level. We, we will figure out why yeah. in a second. Yeah. Is he any good to deal with? He's terrific to deal with. He is, eh? Yeah. Really? Okay. yeah, he is. So apparently you're not as obstreperous or objectionable as some others think you are. Well, I, I hope not. <laughs> how do you see this? I think that's a question. I hope not. <laughs> how, how do you see this issue? Well, let me take a step back and, and talk about downtown. So in 2001, the population of downtown Toronto, 17 square kilometers in size, was 115,000 people. Today, the population of downtown is 250,000 people. It's more than doubled in just over 15 years. In the next 25 years, we expect the population of downtown to double yet again to half a million people. And so TO Core was the very first master plan developed for downtown Toronto since David Crombie was mayor in 1976. For the first time since the 1970s, over an eight-year period, the City of Toronto, our expert staff, city councillors, yeah. Councillor Wong Tam and myself, members of the public, we created a plan to guide future growth. We want growth downtown, and it's coming. But unless that growth includes the infrastructure to support it, hard infrastructure, sewers, hydro, water, social infrastructure, community centres, parks, childcare, unless you build that infrastructure, that growth isn't livable, it's not sustainable, and it jeopardizes our actual prosperity. And so in June, the province announced 224 changes to our plan, a plan that we created over eight years. Changes that threaten that livability. Changes like the following. Um, the sidewalks don't have to be six meters anymore. They can be smaller. Well, in a booming city that's doubling a population, I think you want sidewalks that are large enough. Changes like if you get rid of a child care center, you're not required to replace it in a city that's adding double the people. And so where the representatives from Build are right is that we need to add housing. But where the province got it dead wrong was saying that the city couldn't require infrastructure to make sure that that housing is livable and that the economy here is prosperous. Dave, can I get you to comment yeah. on whether or not you guys are, are great on the building, but maybe a little too soft on some of the other services it's, that we need as well? So I challenge the, uh, and respectfully, the councillor's point of view that, and we've always, as an industry, believed that growth needs to play for growth. We need to build uh, complete uh, communities. And let me address a couple of the, uh, the issues that were raised. Um, parklands, for example. Um, there, is a, there is a change within the TO Core plan to ensure that the way that parklands are charged is in conformity with the bill that uh, Eileen talked about, the Housing Supply Action Plan, so that there's consistency of application on those laws. Within the community benefit charge, there's also a commitment to fund things like community center paramedics and parks uh, to repeat it. I, I think it's also very important that if you take a step back to, to repeat the councillor's language and look at Parklands itself, uh, we did a study with Altus, a recognized economics firm, and over $1.13 billion has been collected across the GTA, to be fair, so not just in the city of Toronto, uh, for parkland charges, cash and loop. That's sitting in the bank. That hasn't been invested in parklands. Just you, let me understand that. That's money that has been 
received by Toronto City Hall from developers? Not for Toronto parking? City Hall. It's across the GTA. Across the GTA. Let me address Toronto City okay. Hall. Six hundred seventy-one million dollars. Okay. And, and parkland charges that is sitting there and hasn't been invested in parks. So I think that that says two things, Steve. Uh, one, there's an obvious commitment to to invest in in parks and to build those complete communities. But there is money in the bank there that can be used for those purposes. So the the outcome. Let me, let me of, just hold you there for a second. Of course. Why hasn't that money been spent yet? Well, I mean, first of all, land in downtown Toronto is extremely expensive. You're looking at 50 to $60 million an acre. It is extremely challenging for a city council to compete with the market forces. I think that uh, this is something that is not refutable. It is the fact. Um, and uh, we have also lacked the, the ability to enforce the developers to provide parkland provisions on site. So one of the tools that we would love to use and one of the tools that has been actually weakened in the 224 unilaterally imposed amendments to the city uh, council this time around uh, by amendment of, uh, you know, uh, OPA 406 is to actually restrict the city's ability to actually uh, uh, collect and, and expand parkland. And I know that there have been times where we've worked with good developers who have actually come to the table prepared to meet the city's uh, city building ob objectives that have said they wanted to invest in the soft and social infrastructure that makes it livable. Okay, but I'm confused yeah. here. If, if, there's, so, if there's more than half a billion dollars sitting in a bank account at Toronto City Hall that's supposed to be spent on parks, but it hasn't been spent yet on parks, why not? So that's what I'm saying is that it is very expensive. So we are not able to necessarily compete with the market forces because what we will do is we'll buy the land, uh, but it's usually at one times density, not to get into too many of the complicated details. Mm -hmm. But if uh, a condominium developer will come along and say the value of the land is 50 60 million dollars per acre the city is not going to pay that because it's not necessarily good value mm. so we do struggle uh, but i also think that teal core was supposed to rectify that problem so by rectifying the problem was to give ourselves greater powers to say that if density is coming and we all can agree at this table growth is here that is not the argument but the argument is that how livable and uh, will these communities be if we don't invest in the infrastructure and provide the infrastructure so Steve, can, I just, can i just push back a little bit on that because uh, the council said we didn't have the ability to require land. And, and that's just not the case. Section 42 of the Planning Act, up until very recently, gave municipalities the ability to require land. So they could say, thanks very much for coming to the table with a development application. But at the I would like, if I could, yeah. I would like, if, if, I, if you're a, a residential development, 5% of your land has to be dedicated for park on the site right now. You can guarantee, you can... You, the municipality is, was, 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 has that authority. They had the alternative or in municipalities' discretion, only in the discretion of the municipality, to ask for cash in lieu of that land. So what we've seen in the past 10 years is that the city of Toronto has repeatedly asked for the cash in lieu. They've said, we don't, we're not going to take the land, and maybe it's because it was too small of a development site in some instances, not all. Maybe it was because there was a long-term plan for a larger park. So maybe it was because... the money that's sitting in that bank account? And that's the money that's sitting in the bank account. So first and foremost, up until the changes in Bill 108, I mean, any municipality in the province could demand the land. And that was a legislative authoritative position. That's not something you could challenge at the OMB. It's not something you could challenge at the LPAT. That was their legislative ability. They waived that in many instances and asked for cash in lieu. Now we've got half a million dollars sitting in a bank account. Half a billion. And 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 we're and we're struggling. You know, I remember I, I used to teach a law course at Ryerson, and one of the first counselors who came and spoke to my class was 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 Counselor Wantam. And she came, I will never forget this. And she stood in front of my class and she said, in my ward, that's the average amount of space mm. that people have access to in parks in my ward. And it left a huge impression on, on my clients and on me. And so since that time, I know it's been a priority for, for both of these counselors to find parkland, mm. but they've had the legislative tools to do it. You don't need to put it in a policy document so what do you think when the planning act gives it to you. I don't know. I don't know why that's been done. Let's find out from Joe Cressy. Well, I, let's take a step back here because we can get into the legal terms very clearly. Here's the bottom line. We created at the City of Toronto a 25-year plan that as one of the objectives was to increase our ability to expand parkland by uh, allowing an alternative rate, so a larger amount of money to be required from developers to go to parkland. That was one of the tools. That's being removed. So we can debate around this table and try to point fingers, but here's the bottom line. The province's changes mean we will collect less money to buy parkland. That's number one. Number two, one of the other changes when we talk about parkland and livability was under our city plan was a requirement that for 44 priority parks in downtown, that we had to restrict the amount of new sunlight on them to ensure that people aren't in shade all day. 
that was removed. And so we can get into a back and forth about why hasn't enough parkland been built with the money the city has, and I could tell you all about my efforts to try to buy $100 million parks. But rather, the bottom line and the fact of the matter is, is that the city created a TO Core plan to protect sunlight on parks and to expand the amount of money we have to buy parks. Both of those provisions were stripped out by this provincial government. And so if you're gonna, if you're gonna double the size of downtown, 17 square kilometers, 500,000 people, my constituents live in towers. The park is their backyard. I don't have a backyard, that's the park. When you make it harder for the city to protect sunlight in those parks and you make it harder to buy new parks, that impacts livability. And that's why Councillor Wong Tam, myself, and Councillor Layton have said very clearly to the development sector, we want you to build. We want certainty for you so that you can build quickly and to help expedite the approvals. But if you come to us with a proposal that's gonna weaken parkland, we're gonna say no. Do you feel that as an industry? Do you feel that his encouragement to build but well, certainly, uh, and I'm going to repeat what Eileen said, we're looking for uh, improvements in processes. We, there's a, the city has a gold standard process that should expedite uh, uh, projects that are uh, aligned with uh, various uh, policy statements at the municipal and uh, provincial level. I will be honest, uh, and, and I think uh, I would be anything but dishonest given the press release we put out. Certainly the red light, green light uh, approach didn't necessarily um, suggest that... that, uh, that um, willingness to look at the housing supply as part of the press conference. Now, I recognize press conferences are what they are, and there will always be individual conversations to move projects forward. But I'd also like to, to build on a point that Councillor Cressy uh, had made around, um, you know, the costs and, and the ability to charge for things like parklands. We have two issues. I think they're very linked. One is housing supply, and I, I completely agree with your numbers. I quote them all the time. And, and I go from 115,000 in the GTA to 75,000 uh, within the city itself and that 500,000 number that, uh, that you've mentioned for the downtown core. So we're not building enough homes. If you look across the GTA, making some assumptions, we should be building 50,000 homes a year. We're around that 38,000. So we need to do a number of things and we need to start addressing the housing for tomorrow. That's one factor. The other factor is how housing is taxed. And so part of it is fees that are collected for parklands. Part of it is the HST. Part of it is the development charges that are meant to, uh, to develop uh, uh, infrastructure within the, the city to support that growth. And, and I want to be very clear uh, at this table, we, we have no problem with growth paying for growth. We believe it's part of the industry's responsibility. But when you add that all up, 22% of a cost of a new condo or 165,000 is a result of aggregate government fees and taxes low rise, which I realize is not a part of what the downtown well, forward looks at. Can we talk, 24%. Can we talk elephants here? I, uh, I love elephants. <laughs> Should we talk I elephants? I have many, in my, many, many elephants in my life. <laughs> Shall we tell you, you guys have uh, run a campaign. There's a snap of it right now. And for those listening on podcast, I'll just describe this. This is a picture of a living room and there are elephants in the, <laughs> in the living room. And um, the headline is the elephants in the room. And these are the elephants that the development industry wants you to know about. They say 22% of the cost of a new home, 22% consists of government fees, taxes, and charges. They say only 4.5% of the available land in the greater Toronto area has been approved for new development, 4.5%. And that number is decreasing. They say it takes on average 11 years to complete a low rise project in the greater Toronto area. The cost of land values in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area has increased by an average of 300% since 2006. And I gather, Dave, the gist of that is, add it all up, and it's a real inhibitor to try to get stuff done. Yeah, I think it's, uh, what we're trying to do with this is, is to in bring transparency to the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, what we've really tried to do as an organization uh, is bring solutions, not complaints. But part of that is identifying the real issues ar around this debate. Um, you know, we, we are supportive of any government policy that will help address that. Whether that's, uh, you know, the end-to-end -end review that is currently going on in the Toronto. We were big believers of that and uh, not to use the jargon, but that's meant to look at uh, reducing redundancies and expeding approval processes to address those 10 to 11 years. Uh, we were supportive of the provincial government's plan because it does provide transparency and 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 consistency across policies and we work at the federal government to address things like the stress test which was another part of uh, some uh, work that we did but what we're trying to do here is to demonstrate that 
there are many facets that are uh, leading to supply and affordability challenges. Let's have a conversation on how to solve those and get at those real issues. The 4.5% land that you talked about, not a downtown core issue, and I, I apologize to broadening the debate from that. Two years before we did that study, so in 2017, the amount of available land uh, for development was 6.9%. Uh, within the GTA. We're not talking Greenbelt here, we're just talking areas that have been designated for uh, for new development. We're whipping through that, that available land at a pace that obviously is going to create some challenges uh, for supply down the road. We believe from a solutions perspective we need to recognize that and to start designating new areas in the fridges of where the current urban uh, growth is to get at that. And also a, a conversation around what is the appropriate amount of tax to be paid for new development? So, so we do believe there's a challenge, and I think we have a consensus at this table around that. Now let's get on to those solutions, which is what those elephants are trying to look for. Okay, lots to chew on there. Kristen, your reaction? Well, I mean, first of all, we are talking about Teal Core and the downtown core, and I want to be very clear that that's what the, the conversation was centered around. And the claims that we don't have enough housing in the downtown core uh, is actually not true. Between 2014 and 2018, we have had over 453 applications under active review that's built or just currently being, uh, uh, that's already been approved. That That is the equivalent of 145,000 plus brand new units. What we're not building, and this is the, the, the pushback from the developers, is oftentimes we're not building a, a diverse range of family size housing. They're not a range of affordability. It is oftentimes single um, uh, owner occupant uh, one bedroom apartments. So the industry is really good at developing that and very bad at developing anything else. So what we have been trying to do, and this is what why Teal Core was so important, is that we worked with the local community, the, we worked with the development industry through a multi-year process, all that public consultation brought forward some, some certain themes, and those themes had to do with livability. That was driving at the heart of it. How do we make sure that we have the infrastructure, uh, social as well as hard, and, and all of that has now been stripped away. Any talk about wanting to build more certainty in the process, well, Teal Core actually had numerical values attached to it. What the province has done is strip that away. So how is that more certain? Um, so, you know, we are trying to do the very best that we can to accommodate the affordable housing crisis. And Teal Core was supposed to be one uh, significant uh, policy uh, change to address that. Okay, but I, uh, I'm confused about one thing. On the one hand, I hear the development industry saying it takes 11 years to get big stuff built. On the other hand, I, you know, Jennifer Kiesmatt, the former chief planner, has been here. You two are saying it as well, that you've got a fairly good streamlined process that gets stuff through to the finish line more quickly. You both can't be right. May Which I, is may, it? May I comment on that? I think um, I, I think I, I, I agree, Councillor. I think what's happening in Toronto is very different than what's happening in the 905 in the outer regions. Um, I, the challenge for me when I'm acting on behalf of a client isn't isn't getting that approval. You know, you, and, and you're quite right. You've got all of these applications coming forward, and you've got a lot of units in the pipeline. Here's the challenge. I get to council. I get my zoning bylaws, which are my, my sort of recipe book or my rules of how high, how big, how much I can build. And I then have a year to two year of a planning process which follows that with staff, where technical review occurs, my site plan application is assessed, and it's there that there's some real problems with the processing of, of applications. The staff is the problem? And it's not because staff aren't working hard, and it's not because City of Toronto staff aren't excellent. I actually went to planning school with a whole bunch of them, and I know they're watching. They're fantastic. <laughs> but it is because there seems to be a logjam in terms of bringing applications through. And, you know, when I saw the red light, green light announcement, uh, there was an awful lot on what you were going to do to stop projects that you didn't like. You know, the, the tree permits and the road occupancy permits and the holding provisions. I can quibble with you on those because as individual councillors, actually, you can't do any of those. All of that has to go to council. Um, but, but the real challenge for me was I didn't understand what the green light was going to be. So, so what's my incentive? This was all stick and no carrot. And so if the green light is an early community consultation meeting and an early date on council, that's great. And that's been helpful. But then I'm still looking at two years of processing. And oftentimes, I'll give you a great example. The six meter sidewalk width. Mm -hmm. I might have a heritage building on my property, which is built to the lot line. Mm -hmm. So then my client says, I'm incorporating that heritage building. Why should the rest of my building be set back if actually the heritage street line is that? That ends up being a six month debate between heritage preservation services and urban design 
over whose number is going to going to rule. How do you make that go faster, though, to resolve that? I think I think there's ways you do it. You know, um, there's if you could if you could assign interdisciplinary teams. If you could say this project's going to have an assigned planner, heritage planner, urban designer, and an engineering staff person, and they're going to meet every three weeks to, to check in with the, with the applicant to see how things are coming along. If we could think about doing that, if we could stop the rotating wheel of planning staff. On a typical application, I have three planners process an application. On the other that hand, means every time you're picking it up, it's a new story. On the other hand, there's more cranes in the skies here than in anywhere else in North America. But that's been the case for about five years, Steve. Okay, so how much of a log jam can there be if I see cranes everywhere? The, the log jam is that there's, there's still you know, half, half a million units that are, that are still in, in the pipeline waiting to get processed. And the log jam is for every one that goes up, there's three or four waiting. Mm -hmm. But I think you so, hit it on the head there. Yeah. So, this debate started with representatives from build industry saying, we need to deregulate in order to increase supply. And TO Core was overly regulation. So let's break that down. All you have to do is look up in downtown Toronto to realize the current framework is getting buildings built. So let's walk through the numbers. 2014 to 2018, 40,000 units of housing was built in downtown Toronto. That's 70,000 people living there. At the same time, we approved 51,000 units in downtown Toronto. That's 80,000 new people who will live in downtown, already approved. And at the same time, we had 55,000 units proposed. Nobody, based on those numbers, mm -hmm. based on looking up at the cranes, and just factual data, we, downtown is the fastest growing neighborhoods in North America. Nobody would look up and say, you know what the real issue is? You know what the Doug Ford government needs to solve? All those regulations stopping buildings from being built. What the province did instead was restrict our ability to ensure that family size units, two and three bedrooms, actually have square feet that are required so that you actually build a unit that people can live in. Restricted our ability to ensure that, as I said earlier, if you get rid of a childcare facility, you're required to replace it. So this had nothing to do with housing supply and burdensome regulations and everything to do with weakening the city's ability to provide livable, sustainable and equitable growth for the future. Let me pick up on that. Would you agree okay. that the industry is great at building luxury condos or these sort of five, six, seven hundred square foot units for singles who just want something, you know, <laughs> cheap and livable, but not so great at the three bedroom apartments that Families no, need to live downtown? You would no. not agree. And, with and let me just pick up on what the councillor had talked about. Uh, so some of the changes in the TO core, and I'll, I'll specifically talk about family size units. Uh, that was one of the changes that had been made around the uh, designation of the size, but it was made because there was duplication. So family size units are uh, defined in the Ontario Building Code and what they look like. So I think that some of the uh, efforts to streamline things, some of the uh, attempts to shorten those time frames around the 10 and 11 years that we talked about, Steve, were part of the uh, direction that the government chose to take. There was also a need to ensure that there wasn't confusion, and we spoke about it earlier in our discussion, and conformity around other changes that were being made in provincial policy around housing supply. So I think it's a little... Um, uh, uh, the facts don't support the suggestion that there is no uh, uh, restriction or definition on what family size units uh, look like. Mm. It's just that they are, but they're not in the TO core plan, they're in the Ontario Building Code, which can is I, king. Can I follow up with this? Do you, do, you, uh, do you acknowledge that there is a responsibility by the development industry that if it wants to put up big buildings in downtown Toronto, it's got to provide concomitant services like parks, rec centres, etc.? Absolutely. You're on side for that? Uh, we, we are about growth, paying for growth. Um, as we talked about earlier around uh, paying those uh, parkland charges, the development charges. Any dispute at that at this table well, here? Well, I'd, I'd yes. like to ask a question then, mm -hmm. because under TO Core, there was a policy we put in place that required the development sector to replace community services if the development proposal got rid of them. So if you came to me with a condo proposal to build a condo and there was an existing childcare there, you had to incorporate that childcare space in. That's what our policy said. Instead, the provincial government said, instead of requiring it to be replaced, it will be encouraged. Right. Mm -hmm. So why would you support getting rid of the requirement to replace a child care centre when it is proposed? So, and, the, and necessary. Sorry, pardon me? When and it's necessary. proposed and necessary. Why right. would you support that requirement to remove yeah. it? They applauded it. 
sorry, we applauded you the... You applauded the government's move to do that. Right. So where I think there, there is a difference of opinion here, and, and that's fair, and that's part of what this discussion is, is do you need to require that particular daycare center to be replaced? Do you need to require that particular social service, whatever it is, to replace there? Or should it be uh, um, accommodated for in other areas? So I, 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 I get frustrated at this notion that uh, that our industry isn't part of the solution from a long-term community building perspective. That is the business that we're in the business of providing housing supply. We're in the business of supporting that growth. We're in the business of uh, providing uh, livable uh, communities. And I think the track record is pretty good at but that. But Joe, it sounds like your quibble is less with him and more with the Ford government oh, at Queen's is. Park. Absolutely. And, you know, when, when I have representatives from the development industry say I'm being outrageous and playing games, it's, it's silly, but I'm not too worried about it because they're not my enemy by any stretch. In fact, we work together frequently, all of us around this table. It's the provincial government because this <coughs> provincial government claimed that the changes they made to TO Core was about housing affordability. But this is the same provincial government that got rid of rent control for buildings built after 1991. This is the same provincial government that weakened the city's ability to require affordable housing be incorporated into new developments. Okay, but you know why they got rid of rent controls after 90. They, they, they went back to, us, to the way it was. This wasn't particularly new policy. It was the wind government that decided That's that right. rent controls ought to go on everything. But when you walk through all of this, claims that they are deregulating to make housing more affordable, when you combine getting rid of rent control, making it harder to build affordable housing in new developments, and then at the same time weakening our ability to build livable, sustainable neighborhoods, that's where you realize none of this has to do with housing supply. and It all has to do with making money for a select number of developers. So can I, I challenge that? Because I, I do have a challenge with that. And, and, and you know, yeah. some of the, some of the, and I, pardon me for, uh -huh. uh, Pardon me for uh, speaking over you. Um, some of the changes on uh, affordability. Uh, let me use one uh, very specific that was in the Housing Supply Action Plan, but obviously applies to any development in TO Core. Was development charges are a fee that is paid to support uh, infrastructure in, in the development. It's something that our industry has uh, not a challenge with and recognizes as part of uh, uh, doing appropriate business. When those development charges were paid and applied, used to be to use some, some uh, uh, industry language here, above grade. So when the building uh, broke grade. What the uh, Housing Supply Action Plan has done from the provincial government is it's at the, at the stage of first permit. So when you start building that building, you know what your DCs are. Because in some cases, it can take two to three years for um, the, the building to get above grade and the costs go up uh, exponentially. And, and you know, part of what we've seen is almost an 800% increase in development charges. So. I challenge around the notion that the policy was uh, designed to make a select few rich. Uh, I don't accept that premise, and we can agree to disagree on that. It really was to provide that certainty around what the costs are, to ensure that the process was as efficient as possible and remove a duplication that we've talked about well, to province, get the building in. Sorry, the province has said, Kristen, that yeah. what they're trying to do here is spur on development mm -hmm. in order to create homes in a city where fewer and fewer people can afford to live. Right. And Does this, that make sense? Well, and this this particular government was lobbied very heavily by the development industry. So I think that, you know, Councillor Cressy is extremely diplomatic, but these these changes did not come because the minister decided one day that he's going to just put forward 224 uh, unilateral changes. They were almost written and taken out of letters that I have actually seen from the development industry asking for these changes to TO Core. If we track back to even the development industry's uh, position leading up to TO Core being approved, it was exactly the same things that they were asking for. And once again, it was then repeated to the to the government. And, and interestingly enough, they would listen to the development industry industry. They did not listen to city council. They did not listen to the public, uh, you know, through the public consultation of informing TO Core. And that is something that has to be discussed on the table, is that these are the changes that the development industry lobbied for, and they got that. And just to speak about, yeah. just for a minute, about the development process. Um, of course, every single process can be approved. Like, we can probably think about how we can make our homes more efficient, right? Um, but 
the, 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 the reality is that some of these applications are extremely complicated. You are trying to wedge a thousand new units into a particular small site, and it has to, uh, it's abutting adjacent um, streets, that it has heritage impacts. Those are complicated. So to, uh, to assume that you can probably just go into city council and make those changes and request that they'll be magically uh, approved is, uh, is actually not, you know, it's, it's not realistic. Yeah, in some cases, so, we're talking so, $500 million developments here. Yeah. These are huge. Well, Yes, but also some of them are going there, are, but there are times, but there are times, no, if I can just say, but there are times when, when we go to star applications that meet the city building objectives, and I can think of universities, hospitals, affordable housing, and, and uh, development that actually brings us the, the wide range of, uh, of flexibility use, and it's actually what we are looking for. It meets all the build form requirements. Those applications go through anywhere from four months to eight months, and that is a fact. I mean, so it's not a fact. Um, it, it I've got a gold star development application on Eastern Avenue right now for a major Fortune 500 company. I've been waiting six months for engineering comments. What, what, what's a gold six. star application? A gold star application is exactly what the councillor just indicated. It's a, a process set up and headed up by economic development in the city of Toronto where they say if you're bringing us jobs, if you're addressing our policies, if you're a gold star application, if you're the kind of application we want, we're going to fast track you. It may happen, and I love the caveat you said, when you meet all of our built form requirements. You've got a zoning bylaw. A zoning bylaw that notionally was adopted in 2013, that was supposed to be the new comprehensive bylaw for the City of Toronto, that brings forward the zoning standards in some cases from the 1960s and 70s. It doesn't even conform to your current official plan, and we all know that. So the notion that I'm going to meet the built form standards on a property that's still zoned from the 1970s when I'm trying to build you a, a building for 2021, it's not going to work. But I, I want to go back to, to the core problem that we have here. We have an official plan amendment which the City of Toronto chose as a council to give to the province to review and approve. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to do that, Steve. And in fact, they started the process for that official plan amendment under a different provision of the Planning Act that wouldn't have allowed them to elevate it to the province. They made that decision and that then put in place a process under the Planning Act where the province is entitled to review and modify. What I think is really important is I read many times the, Can the, I just check one thing? Was there a different government in place when they sent that up for review? There, there was. As well, a that might have had something to do with it. And that might have had something to do, right? with, it, something to do yeah. with it. And mm -hmm. they might have, they, they might have made a calculated decision, which is what I think they did, that the the government that's in force is going to rubber stamp our plan, and we are going to be immune from well, appeal for two years. They were ideologically more like-minded when the Wynn government was in power. But here's what happened, and the staff report says that it says many of the amendments were, that were made were to bring it into alignment with the new legislation. And, and so we're, we're back in a circumstance where you have to conform to what the province says. And so that's where we are. We're down to our last two minutes here. You want to respond? So the City of Toronto provided our TO core plan for the to the province for approval. One, because that strengthens our plan under the Planning Act. But more than that, here's what we know. We provided a plan to the province and the civil servants, the bureaucrats in the province reviewed it. I'm told that those bureaucrats provided nine changes to the minister. How many changes did the minister make? 224. 224. So who suggested those other changes? Because it wasn't the bureaucrats What's of the, the province. Answer? Who did? Well, we just have to suppose. But I think Kristen Wong Tam earlier said that we saw the letters in advance around what the development sector felt about our plan. But, but as that, our time is winding up, yeah. so what are we going to do with it? Well, and so right? here, that's when we take question. a step back, as a downtown councillor, I'm committed to building a downtown that's going to be livable for the future, that's going to be prosperous, and it's going to be a place where people want to live and want to have jobs and work. And the provincial government has imposed a bunch of changes on us that's going to threaten that. And so that's why, proactively, Councillor Wong Tam and myself have said very clearly to the development sector, if you bring us a plan that conforms with the City of Toronto's past TO Corps plan, we're going to green light it. We're going to work really hard with you, Eileen, to get that thing passed in under six months. We'll work with you. But if you bring forward a plan that doesn't replace that child care centre that you said should be encouraged, not required, we're going to work to red light it and stop it. Can I, so can I just challenge on that, if <laughs> okay, I may? Quickly. And there's two things I want to say, and I will speak as fast as I can. <laughs> um, um, suggesting that, uh, you know, consulting with government is an inappropriate thing from our industry, I, I, I don't believe that. We will consult with governments across all levels, and our, our message is going to be very consistent. Well, we you have say a, consult, but it's uh, lobbying. Uh, is well, really what it is. consult, uh, you know, discuss, provide our views. That's where in the responsibility at. We have a responsibility to future homeowners to do that, that want to move to the GTA. We will always be focused on how do we uh, address the supply challenges that we're proud of. We're proud of being a, a, 
uh, part of that. It is a responsibility. That is what our organization does. And I think that's part of democracy. So I have a, I have a challenge no with there. suggesting that um, um, that's inappropriate. And it, it's not just the provincial government. It's municipalities across the GTA mm -hmm. and it's the federal government. And, and in addition to, and, I, and I'll let Eileen speak to this, um, whether the, the um, project supports the, the city of Toronto TO core or the TO core approved by the province, I think there's only one. There's only one TO, plan. So perhaps there's only one plan. the lawyer in the room, I'll let address well, it. It's not just the lawyer in the room. I mean, I, I wonder, I, I really wonder whether, you know, Mr. Lintern, who's the chief planner of the city, had any input on this red light, green light. Because his planning staff have an obligation to look at the in-force plan. And so, you know, you're frustrated at how it re the result. I understand that. That's been made very clear. But that's your plan. Well, and that's the plan that your, your own staff and that the professional mm -hmm. planners that my clients work with mm -hmm. have to apply. This so, is a, I have to say, but, this is a fascinating relationship mm -hmm. because you, you all need each other at yeah, the end of right. the day. Absolutely. And yet, I, you know, for 35 years, I've watched you all fight hammer and tongue with one <laughs> another. Maybe not you two specifically, but... This is the way it always seems to go. Is this just built into the process? There's well, sometimes think, a healthy tension. A and healthy tension. And sometimes not. Well, and, 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 and I think as counselors, yeah. this is where we come in to provide certainty and clarity to our partners in the development sector. And so let me give you an example. Councillor Wong Tam and myself require that on every development that comes in, that some of the money we collect for community benefits goes to affordable housing. Every single one. That's not a City of Toronto staff policy. That's ours. We require on every single development in our wards that prior to the implementation of family size units, that a percentage would be family size. That's not staff, that wasn't staff policy, that's ours. Meaning they don't get your vote at council unless they satisfy that criteria so of that yours. Correct. That's correct. Okay. And the development sector has not quibbled with those. They've worked with us. And just as the development sector worked with us on those examples that I mentioned around affordable housing and family size units, we're confident that our new red light, green light system will provide the certainty in future livability if the development sector works with us. I think the problem is that the red light, green light is referencing back to and relying on a plan which is not in force and is not law. And the difficulty that these councillors are going to have is that I don't see a council resolution on this and I don't think there's going to be one because a municipality cannot take a position that they are going to purposefully frustrate development that is in conformity with the provincial legislation and plans. That's in the City of Toronto Act, and, and that's the bind that we find ourselves in. On that note of unanimity and consensus, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take it and run. I want to thank you all for thank coming to much. TVO tonight Thanks for a grand much. discussion thank you. about what's happening to the downtown of our capital city. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.